on World News Tonight. Resetting ties. The three amigos are back to revitalize lost bonds at the White House. Migrant mayhem. Belarus works to ease tensions as the displaced masses get relocated. Booster for all. The FDA expected to green light boosters for all adults. Edible wizardry. A huge Hogwarts cake unveiled to mark 20 years of Harry Potter films. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off in the United States. The leaders of Canada and Mexico made a visit to the White House as U.S. President Joe Biden held talks to avert economic tensions and focus on reforming bonds. It's an honor to, uh, to welcome our two closest neighbors to the White House today. U.S. President Joe Biden hosted the leaders of Canada and Mexico at the White House on Thursday for their first North American summit in five years. Talks aimed at revitalizing regional cooperation but shadowed by economic tensions. Earlier on Thursday, two separate bilateral meetings in the Oval Office. First, Biden met with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and then Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador. When, in brief remarks to reporters, Biden cited migration among the main issues they were tackling. Together we're taking on problems, mutual problems that affect our people, getting the pandemic under control, driving an inclusive economic recovery, and addressing migration. The talks were aimed at finding common ground among the three neighbors bound together by the United States-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, which governs some $1.5 trillion in North American trade annually. While major breakthroughs could be hard to come by, Biden hoped to make headway on some of the thorniest challenges with America's two biggest neighbors, including easing immigration pressures, reducing trade friction, recovering from the global pandemic, and competing better with China. Among the tangible gains expected from the North American Leaders Summit are agreements on new methane curbs and COVID-19 vaccine donations. Yesterday, we crossed 250 million doses delivered to 10 countries and on our way to meeting our commitment of 1 billion, 200, 200, 200 million doses donated for free, no strings attached, to the rest of the world. The deals stem from a push by Biden to revive the so-called Three Amigos, a working group ditched by his predecessor Donald Trump. Resetting ties with Mexico and Canada is also part of Biden's effort to turn the page on the Trump era, shifting away from his predecessor's go-it-alone approach to a more collaborative style. Just days after President Biden held his first summit since taking office with Chinese President Xi Jinping, he has hinted at a possible diplomatic boycott of 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. While he did not elaborate on what it could look like, such a move would almost certainly reignite already simmering U.S.-China tensions. President Biden says he's weighing a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing. This means Washington could decide not to send a delegation of government officials to the Chinese capital. His comments come just days after he held a virtual summit with his Chinese counterpart to seek ways to reduce tensions between the two superpowers, which have flared over Taiwan, trade policies and other issues. However, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said Thursday that President Biden's consideration of a diplomatic boycott is not related to his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Rather, she explained the administration is deeply concerned about the human rights abuses in China's Xinjiang region. Human rights advocates have spent months lobbying the White House to call for a full-scale U.S. boycott of the 2022 Games. They hope a Washington-led boycott would send a strong message to China as well as other authoritarian countries about America's commitment to endorse democratic freedom. The U.S. traditionally sends a group of high-profile dignitaries, often led by the sitting vice president or the first lady, to attend Olympic events such as the opening and closing ceremonies. First Lady Jill Biden led the U.S. delegation to the 2020 Tokyo Summer Games. 
Belarus authorities cleared the main camps where migrants had huddled at the border with Poland in a change of tack that could help calm a crisis that has spiraled in recent weeks into a major east-west confrontation. Escorted by Belarusian soldiers, hundreds of migrants step away from the Polish border. They were then taken by buses to unknown locations. According to officials, most were transferred to this refugee centre provided by Minsk. A sign that Belarus's ruler, Alexander Lukashenko, is keen to show his willingness to defuse tensions with the European Union. However, some 2,000 people are staying at the border near the Polish town of Kuznica, even after their makeshift camp was closed. The move came a day after fresh skirmishes broke out between the migrants and Polish security forces. The refugees, most fleeing conflict and despair in the Middle East, have not given up hope of reaching Western Europe. Here, people rejoiced at the news that Belarus and the EU had agreed to hold talks, following another phone call between President Lukashenko and Germany's Angela Merkel. While Minsk presented it as a diplomatic breakthrough, Brussels insisted the talks would focus on humanitarian aid and technical support for repatriating migrants. The EU does not recognize Lukashenko as the legitimate leader of Belarus. Western diplomats have accused him of using the migrants as pawns to destabilize the bloc in retaliation for its sanctions on his authoritarian regime. Global supply chains risk are spurring inflation across the world, with companies getting more expensive bills for their raw materials and components. And such an impact could be bigger for South Korean manufacturers, as many of them rely on imports. Global supply chain disruption has been accelerating inflation across the world. South Korean manufacturers are among those who have taken the hit, as many of them rely on imports. The Korea Economic Research Institute asked 100 firms out of the top 500, and they said the cost of raw materials this year increased by some 18% from a year ago. By sector, steel saw the biggest surge, jumping almost 30%. This comes as countries like the U.S., Russia, and China have been enforcing tariffs on their exports of scrap iron, which was once cheap and readily available. Such price hikes in raw materials could be passed on to consumers, as firms are likely to jack up their prices. 34% of the firms said they are already dealing with the issue by raising their product prices by an average of 14%. Experts say that in order to weather the storm of global supply chain disruption, South Korea, which likes raw materials, has to diversify import channels as well as joining economic blocks. Amid mounting concerns, the IMF has also warned that inflation could hang around longer in some countries if the disruption to the global supply chain lingers. The agency warned central banks on Thursday to remain vigilant over inflationary pressures, adding that it's working through scenarios on monetary policies and the potential impact on the global economy. Security forces shot dead at least 15 people and wounded dozens as thousands of Sudanese took to the streets on the deadliest day in a month of demonstrations against military rule. <laughs> Activists in Sudan are calling for an escalation of protests against the coup there. And a Sudanese court has ordered the detention of the heads of the country's three telecommunications companies until internet services are restored. All after the deadliest day so far, according to medics, in a month of demonstrations. Medics aligned with the protest movement said at least 15 people were killed on Wednesday as security forces dispersed protests in Khartoum and other cities with gunfire and tear gas. Witnesses said mobile phone communications were also cut. Sudanese police said 89 officers were wounded. They recorded one civilian death and 30 cases of civilians choking on tear gas. The protesters, marching against an October 25th coup, demanded a full handover to civilian authorities and for the leaders of the coup to be put on trial. They were heard chanting, the people are stronger and retreat is impossible. The coup upended a power-sharing arrangement between the military and civilian groups put in place in 2019 after the toppling of long-ruling autocrat Omar al-Bashir. Protesters described the behavior of police on Wednesday as more aggressive than in the past. It's the latest sign that the military is looking to entrench its position. 
The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back and on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. German leaders agreed tough new curbs on the unvaccinated with plans to shut them out of restaurants, sporting events and cultural shows as the country battles to halt a record rising COVID infections. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. With new cases falling to an all-time high, leaders of Germany's 16 states agreed after crisis talks with Chancellor Angela Merkel to require those not immunized to provide negative tests in order to use public transport or go to the office. To protect the most vulnerable, they also agreed to introduce compulsory vaccination for healthcare workers and employees in elderly homes. Unvaccinated people will be banned from certain public places in areas with a hospitalization rate of more than three patients per 100,000 people over the past seven days. The so-called 2G rule, allowing in only the vaccinated and the recovered, will apply to large events as well as leisure and sports facilities. Areas with a hospitalization rate of more than six will have to introduce a 2G plus rule, where participants will need to be tested as well as vaccinated, and regions with a rate over nine will have to introduce extra measures such as contact restrictions. Back to Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adadarana World News Special Correspondent Inu Kaponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. A lot more Americans are about to be eligible for booster shots with Pfizer's and Moderna's COVID vaccines, but there's a lot of confusion out there as the eligibility of boosters have been varying for the past few months. With winter looming and COVID cases rising, the FDA is likely to authorize both Pfizer and Moderna boosters for all adults by tomorrow. The CDC expected to follow suit. The change potentially creating more confusion. It was August when President Biden first promised boosters for Good every afternoon. adult. It will be easy. Just show your vaccination card and you'll get a booster. But in September, an FDA panel concluded boosters were only necessary for those over 65. The governor of Connecticut mocking the process today. CDC speaks Latin. I can't figure out who's eligible, who's not eligible. If you smoked uh, while you're in high school back in the 1970s, you're eligible. Um, I think if you haven't been vaccinated or in you know more than six months, now's the time to get the booster. Connecticut, more than one of a dozen states, plus New York and Chicago, that took action on their own, putting pressure on the FDA. So what will now constitute being fully vaccinated? The CDC still isn't counting boosters, but at least two governors are already saying residents must have a booster to be considered fully protected. Economic expansion in South Korea is causing repercussions to what little land there is left on the country as dodgy development slowly erodes its beaches. South Korea's Sajonjin Beach is a surfer's paradise, but fast economic expansion is chewing away at the waterfront. It's one of 43 beaches in the country facing serious coastal erosion. The damage is driven mostly by dodgy development, and now people there face an unpredictable situation. Guesthouse owner Choi Jong-min has watched the high waves wipe away major portions of the beach this year, exacerbated when a typhoon hit in August. Until 2019, Jin was as wide as 130 feet, but during a recent visit, the beach had narrowed to about 10 feet. Early developers removed large sections of sand dunes to lay a coastal road and seawalls were built too close to the shore, leading to erosion. Professor at Kangwon National University, Kim In-ho, explains how it all went so wrong. This grass acts as a reinforcement and is holding on to the sand, but all these coastal road structures have been built above it here. The erosion is caused by these structures. Some business owners said they have been forced to relocate. In other spots, steep sand dunes as high as 5 metres have formed, triggering safety concerns and disrupting tourism. Authorities plan to supply more sand and flatten beaches in the affected areas while devising long-term recovery plans. But some experts say the damage has already been done. The construction of a floating dock designed to supply coal to a nearby power plant has compounded the problem. 
Activists fear a planned breakwater at the power plant could cause further damage by diverting the force of the waves during storm surges to other parts of the beach. Rising sea levels and unpredictable weather are also threats to soft sand beaches like Sajonjin. Trials are finally underway after an extremely long detention period for aid workers in Greece as activists rallied outside the courthouse to stop pressurizing aid programs. Sean Binder is one of 24 aid workers who went on trial on Thursday on the Greek island of Lesbos, facing charges of spying and disclosing state secrets. The trial was immediately adjourned amid calls from right groups and authorities to drop the absurd charges. Outside the court on Thursday, Binder, who has already spent 107 days in pre-trial detention, waited for the trial to start with his mother. I feel angry. I feel angry that the legal requirement to try and help people in distress out at sea is being criminalized right now. I'm angry because there's not a shred of evidence against us. Today there's no more search and rescue happening on the island of Lesbos, and that's precisely because we criminalize it. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch say the trial is intended to intimidate aid workers from carrying out their work. The European Parliament called the trial, quote, the largest case of criminalization of solidarity in Europe in a report in June. The aid workers on trial were affiliated with the Emergency Response Centre International, or ERCI, a non-profit search and rescue group operating on Lesbos from 2016 to 2018. They face up to eight years in prison, convertible to a fine. Among those tried is Sarah Madini, a Syrian refugee who took an overcrowded dinghy to Greece with her sister Yazra in 2015, at the height of Europe's refugee crisis. She saved the other 19 passengers by pulling their sinking boat to shore for four hours. Madini now lives in Germany and is barred from entering Greece, something her lawyer called a paradox. The aid workers also face more serious felony charges, including people smuggling, belonging to a criminal group and money laundering, which carry 25-year prison sentences. These charges are still being investigated. The defendants deny the charges against them and are expected to plead not guilty. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea reported its highest caseload since the start of the pandemic. President Moon Jae-in urged government officials to do their best to stabilize the situation. iPhone maker Apple is planning to launch fully autonomous vehicles by 2025. The vehicle's interior would be without steering wheels and pedals and be designed for hands-off driving, with one possible design allowing passengers to sit around on U-shaped seats. The top diplomats of China and Japan have spoken on the phone for the first time since the inauguration of Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. During the call, Japan's Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi raised concern over the situation in Hong Kong and human rights abuses in China's Xinjiang region. JS-016, a neutralizing antibody against COVID-19 developed by China, administered with another neutralizing antibody, has been granted emergency use in 15 countries around the world, and its safety and effectiveness have been recognized worldwide. Japan's government announced a record $490 billion spending package to cushion the economic blow from the COVID-19 pandemic, bucking a global trend towards withdrawing crisis mode stimulus measures and adding strains to its already tattered finances. And finally tonight, Warner Brothers unveiled a cake in the shape of the iconic Hogwarts castle to mark the 20th anniversary of the release of the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Cake sculpture Michelle Wibowo took six weeks to create the baked masterpiece, which stands at 1.5 meters tall and 2 meters wide and weighs nearly 100 kilograms. The cake, made from vegan-friendly ingredients, is internally illuminated with 30 lights. The edible model of the world-famous visiting school was revealed at the Warner Brothers studio tour, marking 20 years since the release of the film in UK and Irish cinemas. After being admired by young fans, the cake was donated to One Vision, a Watford-based charity-fighting food party. 
In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.